Okay, so I'll uh, make a start now. Today we are going to learn how to calculate time temperature transformation diagrams. So you've seen this many times now. You have this uh, C curve behavior, which we learned is because at high temperatures or small undercoolings, the driving force is small, and then as you reduce the temperature, the diffusion coefficient becomes small. So there's some temperature in between where there's an optimum rate of reaction. So what do we need in order to calculate a time temperature transformation diagram? Well, we need to be able to understand the nucleation of each phase, okay, the growth of each phase, and then we need to think about impingement. That means that we have particles which are growing from different locations, and eventually they will grow large enough to touch each other. How do we take account of impingement. This is called hard impingement because it's particles actually touching each other. Uh, there's another kind of impingement which is due to the overlap of diffusion fields. So here for example we have two particles growing. Uh, in between we still have the parent austenite as if nothing has happened. You know the concentration is still C bar. Okay? But eventually when they start to approach each other the level will rise above C bar, so they are influencing each other's growth rate even without touching. Okay, because the gradients here have clearly become shallow, right? So that's called soft impingement. So it could be because of overlap of uh, concentration fields, or it could be because of overlap of temperature fields. If we are talking about solidification, say, then a particle growing from here and here will have a latent heat of transformation which will interfere with uh, the growth of another particle. Okay? So we need to take account of all of these factors and I'm going to show you how. Uh, now we've done growth theory for each of the phases and I'm just going to remind you of elementary nucleation theory. You've probably done all this before but let's go through it anyway. So imagine that we've got uh, austenite here and ferrite and austenite is supercooled so, um, sorry, supercooled, so it has a higher free energy than ferrite and therefore that gives me the driving force for transformation. Okay. And when we create a new particle, uh, that chemical free energy change multiplied by the volume, let's assume it's a spherical particle okay. and there might be some strain energy if we are forming the particle in the solid state and then we've got to account for the surface area multiplied by the interfacial energy. So that's the net free energy change if you create a small spherical particle. Uh, the chemical free energy change promotes the growth of that particle. This opposes the growth of the particle and this also opposes the growth of the particle. But because these two both usually scale with the volume of the particle, you can simply reduce this by the strain energy term in whatever equations that you produce. Okay. If I plot this, uh, this term as a function of the radius, uh, this term here increases like so with R squared. Uh, this term here decreases with R cubed. So initially R squared is bigger than R cubed and therefore you get a rise in free energy. It's only when you reach a certain radius that you begin to get a decrease in free energy. So this is like an activation barrier where a small particle, even though the chemical free energy change is negative, will find it difficult to grow. Okay. So how do we get a particle which is greater than R dash if the free energy change is positive? Any ideas? You know, we, we've always said that if the free energy change is positive, then there shouldn't be a spontaneous reaction, right? So how come a particle is able to grow to a size greater than our star? Well, imagine that you can see atoms, okay? And you're looking at an assembly of atoms. They're not frozen. They, they are actually moving about and just by pure chance you might get a cluster of atoms uh, 
in the correct crystal structure which is larger than R star. Okay? And the chance of that happening is proportional to exponential minus G star over RT where G star is the activation energy. Okay? So if you are able to observe nucleation you should be able to see occasionally fluctuations which are large enough to be the product phase. So if I take this equation now and differentiate it okay, with respect to the radius and set this differential to zero then I can work out the critical size beyond which the particle can grow with a reduction in free energy. Okay? And the important thing to note is that the critical size is proportional to the interfacial energy sigma alpha gamma. If we had no interfacial energy then immediately you have supercooled the material a particle would be able to grow. Okay? If I now take this R star and substitute it into this curve here delta G then I can calculate G star so take R star, put it into this equation which is basically this curve and I get the activation energy G star which is proportional to the cube of the interfacial energy. So you can see that the interfacial energy is extremely important and the activation energy is very sensitive to the interface energy. And that is the reason why we often get metastable phases forming because they are easier to nucleate than the stable phases. So can you give me an example of a metastable phase in steel which thermodynamically is less stable than another phase but it's kinetically favored because the interfacial energy is smaller. Sorry? So the margin site is because we don't have enough atomic mobility but what I want is an example where a phase forms in preference to a more stable phase because the interfacial energy is smaller. Sorry? Hmm? Cementite, yeah. And what is the more stable phase than cementite? Graphite. So, strictly speaking, graphite is uh, more stable than cementite. So, there's an iron graphite phase diagram, okay? But cementite can form very rapidly. Uh, because it has a good interface with the uh, matrix and therefore is kind of favored. This, this is a cube of the interfacial energy. The activation energy varies with the cube of the interfacial energy. And there are many, many examples. In aluminum alloys, you get a whole sequence of precipitation. So you start with zones of copper atoms, GP1 zones, GP2, uh, theta prime and then theta all the first three phases are not stable with respect to the final but they have coherent or semi-coherent interfaces and therefore low interfacial energies. Okay, okay. Uh, once we've got the activation energy and the critical radius I explained to you that the chance of seeing a fluctuation of atoms is proportional to exponential minus G star upon RT right? That's, uh, that's the term over here. This is the chance of seeing a fluctuation which can be greater than R star. Okay. Uh, this term here is because we still need to transfer atoms across the interface and there might be a barrier actually at the interface which influences the process of growth and this is a constant term. This is not a constant term because it depends on the driving force, the magnitude of the driving force, the undercooling below the equilibrium temperature. And this is an attempt frequency. Right? So you make many, many attempts to cross the barrier, but the probability of a successful at, uh, attempt will be proportional to this term here. And this is the number density of sites where nucleation can happen. So it could be that you know every individual atom is a nucleation site or it could be that the grain boundary is a nucleation site in which case you know a smaller grain size gives you a larger um, nucleation rate and so on. So this is basically classical nucleation theory. Uh, 
where you have a term that depends on the cube of facial energy. You have a constant term here which represents the barrier for atoms to transfer across the boundary. This is an attempt frequency and this is the number density of nucleation sites. That means the number of sites per unit volume. Everyone happy with nucleation theory? Okay. Now, this diagram comes from a paper which was written in 1939, you can see, by Avrami. And we've done nucleation, we've done growth. Now we've got to talk about particles colliding with each other as they grow. Okay? So these areas, for example, on this diagram, which is due to Avrami, cannot be real because particles can't grow through each other. But supposing that we allow particles to grow through each other, then the calculation becomes very simple. You know, you just have nucleation rate, growth rate, and you work out how the volume changes as a function of time, temperature, etc. Your answer will be wrong, because you can't have particles growing through each other. But if the volume fraction is very small, then the chances of particles touching each other is also small. So in the early stages of transformation, you can ignore impingement effects, but not if the volume fractions become substantial. Or if particles are forming on a grain boundary, they will touch even if the volume fraction is not large. Okay? So how do we cope with this impingement? Avrami and some others came up with very beautiful theory, which is extremely simple to explain. And this is just to show you an example of particles, all approximately spherical, and the volume fraction is large, so they begin to touch and interfere with each other's growth. Okay? So this is a glassy material which is devitrifying, that means it's crystallizing. So this theory is completely different. It applies to any material in which you are getting transformations, not limited to steels. Right, let's imagine that we're looking at austenite, which has transformed into two particles of ferrite at a time t. Short time later, uh, delta t later, these particles which have be, will have become larger. So this is the increase in the volume of the particles. And we might also have two more particles nucleating. So here we have two particles new particles which have formed. So what's wrong with that second diagram? Yeah, so that should not be possible. That's a region which has already transformed. Yeah. Now, what is the probability that a new particle will form in untransformed material? Hmm? Yeah, so it's, the, it's proportional to the volume of untransformed material, right? So, a very, very, whoops, very simple equation that the change in volume, the true change in volume, is related to the change in volume when you add up all particles, even if they are growing through each other. Okay, you add up all the dark blue areas in the previous slide, that is going to give you the wrong answer. Okay? Uh, so we call that the extended volume. That means you're allowing particles to grow to each other. That is this parameter here. If I multiply that by the probability of finding untransformed material, that means the volume of transformed material divided by the total volume here, and 1 minus that gives me the volume, uh, the probability of finding new particles in untransformed material, a clear relationship between the true volume and the extended volume change. Yeah? Is everyone happy with that? This is the fundamental relationship. Okay. Now, of course, uh, when we use uh, things like probabilities and so on, we are assuming that nucleation happens randomly at random locations. If it's happening at a grain boundary, you have to put a second factor, which is the probability of impingement along grain boundaries. So we have an extended area argument, and you, 
then change that to extended volume. But it's, it's not difficult to do. Uh, this is the change in real volume and this is the change in extended volume. If I take this term onto this side, then we have dV alpha divided by this term, which is a bit like dx over x, right? So when you integrate dx over x, you get log x, don't you? So when I do that, I get a relationship between the real volume fraction and the extended volume fraction by unlogging the integral. Okay, so this is 1 minus exponential extended volume over total volume and volume of alpha over the total volume. In other words, this is the volume fraction, the true volume fraction. Okay? So that's very, very simple derivation from this. I just take this term onto this side, integrate both sides, and I will end up with the relationship between extended volume and real volume. And the problem is solved because the extended volume is a lot easier to calculate. You forget about impingement, yeah? And just work out how many particles and how big they are growing in a certain time and you've got the volume, right? Everyone happy with that? Okay, let's uh, do the um, process. Uh, we've got these uh, roughly spherical particles growing and we've got impingement at various locations here. Uh, let's see how these particles evolve. Not all of the same size, right? Some will have formed early in the transformation sequence, other will have nucleated later in the transformation sequence. So if we were observing that system and assuming that the growth rate is constant, that means there's no composition change while the particle is growing, uh, you will see that there is a particle which nucleates at the time tau of one Short time later, there might be another particle which will grow uh, to a size that is smaller than the earlier one, and so on. Okay, so if we were watching the system transforming, then at time tau one we just have one particle. Later we have another particle nucleated, and this particle has grown. And similarly, we can continue this analysis. So the gaps here are not necessarily equal but a particle does not exist before it nucleates. Yeah? So particle 1 nucleated at time equal to 1, particle 2 at time equal to 2, and so on. Right, so... Uh, Based on the nucleation rate, yeah. the Correct. Absolutely. Volume change, density change. Yes, yes. Okay, but what's that got to do with? Uh, so, uh, this does not conserve, ensure that the volume. Oh, I see. Yeah. So, as a first approximation, assume that there is no volume change. Okay? But it's not difficult to take account of volume change. Yeah. But still, assume that there is no volume change. Yeah. Uh, even then, it says that, compares, it only says that if the extended volume is too much, Um, no, there's no rate there, okay? There's no time in this. It's simply saying that if you allow particles to grow through each other, then there will be material which does not exist. Yeah? So we are not, we don't have driving force, we don't have time, don't have temperature, anything in that. It's simply a geometrical correction. Yeah? Okay. Uh, if I look at the volume of a particle which has formed at time tor 1, the particle doesn't exist before tor 1. Okay? Therefore, I have to uh, only start growth after the incubation period of that particle. Okay? And that's why I have T minus tor. And the cube is because we are assuming that it's a spherical particle. So the growth rate cubed times time cubed gives me 
the volume of the particle after multiplying by 4.3 pi. Okay? So that's the volume of a particle which has nucleated after a particular incubation period tor. Okay? Uh, if I now allow a, a little bit more time to form, then uh, this will be bigger and more particles might have nucleated. Yeah? So this is of a particle which forms at time tor. But if I multiply the nucleation rate by the amount of volume and the time increment, that gives me the number of particles which are formed in the interval t to t plus d tor. Right? So this is just nucleation rate is nucleation rate per unit volume per unit time. Right? So if I multiply it by the volume and by the increment of time, I know how many particles nucleate in the time d tor and this is the volume of each of those particles. This is the extended change in volume because we haven't taken account of impingement as yet. Everyone happy with that? So this is the volume per particle nucleated at time tor and this is the number of particles that have nucleated in the time tor plus d tor. Okay? Or in the interval d tor rather. Okay, uh, now we apply the correction. The wrong change in volume corrected to the right change in volume by the probability of finding untransformed material. So all I've done is replaced uh, this term here with the true volume fraction by multiplying this here with the probability of finding untransformed material. Happy with that? Okay, so the same equation here again, the true change in volume related to the nucleation rate, the total volume of your sample, the time, the growth rate, and this is the incubation period tor, and the change in time d tor. And I'm just going to Write volume fraction as this peculiar Greek character psi. Okay, this is the volume of alpha divided by the volume. And if I integrate this now, remembering that this is dV alpha and this is like uh, 1 minus V alpha over V, so it's like dx over x. Then I get log minus log 1 minus the volume fraction of alpha is related to this, where we allow tor to vary from zero to any particular time that you want to monitor the evolution of volume fraction. Yeah? So this integral is for tau going from zero to any particular value of time. Right? When I integrate that, I get the master equation, which is the volume fraction as a function of the growth rate, the nucleation rate, and time. Now notice that the growth rate was constant, so the volume was proportional to the cube of time. Yeah? And the nucleation rate was also constant, uh, so nucleation rate multiplied by time gives us the number of particles per unit volume. And notice the exponent here is 4. In other words, if growth is isotropic, then you have the 3 coming from the growth, and then nucleation rate times time, so you have another time, and therefore we have an exponent 4. Supposing that we have a constant nucleation rate and diffusion control growth, what would you expect the time exponent to be? Okay, so we, we still have a constant nucleation rate, but the growth is now diffusion controlled. How does a particle dimension vary with time in diffusion control growth? Sorry? No, no. We are saying there's a constant nucleation rate. Sorry? Think again, think again. 
Yeah. Let's think about allotriomorphic ferrite. How does the dimension vary with time? You know, you've got partitioning of solute, right? So, is, are you going to get constant nucleation rate? Uh, constant, sorry, growth rate? Remember, we build up solute in front of the interface, so how does the dimension change with time? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. So, how does, how does the dimension vary with time? Come on, guys. What's that shape? Parabolic. Do you remember? Dimension varying with t to the power of a half. Right? So, supposing you've got a sphere growing, how will its volume change with time? t to the power of hmm? 3 upon 2, right? One of the dimensions changes with time to the half. So, if it's a sphere, then it's the cube of that, which is t to the 3 upon 2. And then, if we have a constant nucleation rate, we add 1 to that. So, the exponent of time here would be 5 upon 2. Okay. So, if you plot this versus uh, a function of time, you can derive the exponent and it gives you some clue on the mechanism of transmission. If you find that this exponent is 5 upon 2, then it cannot be a constant growth rate. Okay? Now, a word of caution is that that exponent can have several different mechanisms. It's not unique, but it gives you an idea about what's going on. All right, so here's another question. Supposing you had no nucleation, that means you just started from some seeds and only a constant growth rate, what would be the exponent be? So, constant growth rate, no nucleation. Constant growth rate, yeah. How does the volume of the particle change with time if there's a constant growth rate? Yeah, so what's the, how does the volume change with time? Cubed. Uh, and since we are starting from seeds, nucleation is not necessary. So, this would be cubed. Okay? So, there's a whole list of these exponents uh, in standard textbooks like uh, Christian's theory of transformations in metals and alloys, which can help you to deduce the nature of the transformation by plotting the double log of psi versus time. Okay? Log log psi versus time. So, this is called the Avrami exponent here, right? t to the power of n. And, you know, you can, you can write this equation in this form, and this is the Avrami exponent here. Now, there are so, there is a, a lot of misunderstanding about this theory. Uh, this is completely rigorous. There, there's no you know, you've got proper growth rates, nucleation rates, there's nothing empirical about this equation. Yeah? But people apply this empirically. That means they just take their data and plot it and find a k and an n, and that may not be physically meaningful because there's no understanding of mechanism. So, Avrami theory is not at all empirical. It's probably the most powerful theory for modeling transformation kinetics, and you can make it as complicated as you like. You know, you can have uh, many different mechanisms of growth, uh, nucleation or no nucleation, soft impingement, hard impingement, everything can be put into that. 
So if somebody tells you that Avrami theory is empirical, they basically don't know what they are talking about. Okay? Okay, let's continue. So these are typical transformation curves where we plot the volume fraction versus time. Can you explain to me why at first the reaction is slow? Hmm? No, no, speak louder. Yeah. No, this is constant temperature. Okay. So why does the reaction start slow in this region here? It is doing that. Yeah. But when you have small particles, you know they are not contributing much to volume as they grow, right? Why is the reaction slow at later stages of transformation? Hmm? Yeah, so there's not much parent phase left. So it's, it's kind of reaching an equilibrium value. Yeah? And in between you have a rate which is large. So this is, a, this is known as a sigmoidal curve and it's typical, you know, if you do a dilatometric experiment isothermal transformation, you'll pick up a curve like this. Okay? Now, of course, this is how time temperature transformation diagrams are derived. Because you could say, okay, the start of reaction is when I get 0.1 volume fraction of transformation. Uh, so, here, and I put that as my start time at this particular temperature. I do this experiment for different times, uh, different temperatures, and I derive the times, the start times for the different temperature and plot a curve. Okay? Or you can calculate these curves as I've explained to you. And from this you get a time temperature transformation diagram where the C curves will represent different volume fractions of transformation. Okay? So here, for example, I'm plotting the start of the reaction and the finish of the reaction. And of course, when you're doing experimental measurements, uh, your machine has some sort of detection limit. So you have to define what start means. You know, if the f amount of material you can detect is a volume fraction of 0.1, somebody else's equipment, which has a higher resolution, will have an earlier start time. All right? So it's important when you do these uh, diagrams to specify what you mean. Is this a 1% transformation time? Is it a 2%, 5%? And similarly for finish, you know, the curve is reaching asymptotically to a limit. So you can, you know, depending on the resolution of your equipment, the finish time will depend on that. So you could say 95% transformed, for example. Okay? Right. We've done... Uh, time temperature uh, transformation diagram and how you calculate it. But life is never simple. Okay? You don't get just one phase forming at, the, at any time. You might get perlite and bainite forming at the same time. Right? So how do you deal with that? Well, it's actually very simple. Supposing you've got these two particles of alpha and later on they've grown and you nucleate two particles of beta. This equation is not sufficient any longer because it deals with just one phase. So how can I modify this theory to account for two different phases? So for either phase, you know, the probability of uh, getting true transformation is still proportional to the total amount which is untransformed. Yeah? So all we have to do is to write two of these equations, one for alpha, one for beta, and to replace this term here by V alpha plus V beta. Yeah. So here, for example, we have one equation for the change in the true volume of alpha. This is now the probability of finding untransformed material. And we will have another equation like this for beta. So dV beta will be equal to this dV extended beta. And then you have to solve those equations simultaneously. Yeah? So you allow a small increment of transformation, adjust 
these values, allow another increment of transformation, adjust these values. So the best way is to solve them numerically. You might have six different phases forming at the same time. Yeah? And when you do a numerical uh, analysis, it becomes very powerful because you can also change the composition of the parent phase as these particles are growing. You know, they are partitioning solute, right? So, you can alter the composition of the parent as the, mater uh, as the material transforms. That effectively takes account of soft impingement, yeah, the overlap of the diffusion fields. So, we enrich the austenite with carbon, for example, in the case of steel, depending on how much ferrite and bainite and so on that you formed. And therefore, you never get to a volume fraction of one because that's how it actually works, right? And in the case of uh, power station steels, where you use elements like chromium, molybdenum, vanadium, uh, when you put the steel into service, it has a certain distribution of precipitates, but it's operating there for 40 years at high temperatures of 600 degrees centigrade, so the precipitates change with time. And you can include all that six different kinds of precipitates in the theory and you don't tell any of the precipitates when to precipitate and when to dissolve. All that happens automatically through the coupling of the equations. Yeah? So just to illustrate, we have these uh, two sets of equations now and you can have any number of these equations depending on how many transformations are possible. Okay? Uh, sorry. And Instead of getting uh, a single curve for a single phase, you may get three curves, one for the total volume fraction transformed, that and that. And these two are interacting with each other through both the change in the composition of the austenite and through the space that they occupy. So obviously if you form beta in a particular region, you can't get alpha in that region. Or even if you formed alpha in another region, you can't get alpha in that region. Yeah? And that's all taken into account uh, by these terms here. So here are some calculations where we say, uh, so this is now continuous cooling, okay? So you can adapt the theory for continuous cooling if it's a, a numerical procedure, it's no problem. Just like you change volume fraction, you also change the temperature and the driving forces, right? So what we are doing is we are taking a particular steel with a hundred micrometer austenite grain size and not saying anything about when each phase will form but we have all the nucleation and growth functions in the model and then when you cool it at this, temp uh, at this rate the first thing you start to get is allotriomorphic ferrite forming okay? then when the conditions become right you begin to get displacive transformations. But notice this is still growing at a certain rate. And then eventually when the carbon concentration of the austenite becomes high enough, you also stimulate perlite transformation. So in this calculation, there is nothing about when to start perlite, when to start Wiedemann-Staden ferrite, when to start allotriomorphic ferrite. All that happens naturally through the coupling of equations. At these temperatures, perlite formation is simply not possible. Okay? And similarly, a lotriomorphic ferrite growth rate is faster than Wiedemann-Staden ferrite okay? because of the mobility of atoms. If I change my cooling rate, this automatically changes to a completely different form. Right? We now have much more of Wiedemann-Staden ferrite because you've suppressed the transformations to lower temperatures by increasing the cooling rate. And notice also that transformation happens over a much bigger range because if you have a cooling rate, then clearly you don't have enough time for transformations to happen compared with a slow cooling rate. All that is automatically captured in those coupled equations. Similarly, if I alter my austenite grain size, make it smaller, then what consequence does it have? Well, you increase the number density of nucleation sites, right? So here is now a calculation with a smaller austenite grain size. 
And you can see that we've basically eliminated weed mustard and ferrite because with a small grain size, you get rapid transformation. Yeah? So allotromorphic ferrite forms to such an extent that there's no driving force left for weed mustard and ferrite to form. If I increase the cooling rate and reduce the amount of allotromorphic ferrite, then I get some weed mustard and ferrite there. Okay. So these uh, models all exist and you should be able to use them to calculate time temperature transformation diagrams not just as a function of uh, grain size and cooling rate but alloy chemistry as well you know you've got carbon manganese silicon nickel moly chrome vanadium and everything that you throw into a steel right so this is extremely powerful uh, method for calculating time temperature transformation diagrams and there's as much error involved in measuring as there is in calculations okay so there's not one method is not better than the other but they are complementary of course one thing that this assumes is that there's no um, the the austenite is fully austenitic yeah you're not starting by intercritical annealing for example or with precipitates in the austenite all that work if you if you need to you you should do it and publish a paper. Yeah? Any questions? <laughs>